be seated. Good morning. We are here today for oral argument in case number CV 22-0008, Vandenbosch v. Vandenbosch. Each side has 20 minutes for your argument. The appellant may reserve some time for rebuttal. I would ask that you just keep track of that yourself. Our proceedings are being audio and video recorded. Please introduce yourself and your client when you start. We've read the briefs, discussed the case at conference, and with that, you may proceed, counsel. Good morning, your honors. Marlene Pontrelli on behalf of the appellant Lindsay Vandenbosch, and I'm here with my colleague Alex Crandall. I would like to reserve a little bit of time at the very end if it's available. This case would be so easy for everyone to say, mom and dad can't get along, not surprising, they're ex-spouses. Go away. We don't want to have to deal with this anymore, and so that's why we're going to say parties can't have joint legal decision making, or even joint legal decision making with one party having final say, because we don't want to have to deal with it in court. And because you haven't been able to get along, that's then not a material change in circumstances at this point. But that wouldn't be right, it wouldn't be the law, and it's not the correct statutory interpretation. There are lots of arguments that are raised in the briefs, but there are two that I would like to focus on today. The first is the award of attorney's fees against mother. Mother has $30,000 of attorney's fees awarded against her for three primary reasons. The first, mother acted unreasonably in continuing to pursue the action without a material change of circumstances affecting the welfare of the child. Second, by failing to follow through with the TI. And three, by challenging father's decision making regarding high school applications when father has sole legal decision making. Counsel, so are you saying that even if we were to agree with the trial court that there were any change in circumstances, it was unreasonable for her to think that there were? Not unreasonable, Your Honor, if you were coming to that conclusion for her to think so, but unreasonable to award attorney's fees. And that's because all the blame for this petition is being put on mother. And that's not the facts. The underlying facts show that mother filed this petition for change of modification of parenting time and legal decision making in October of 2019. A motion to dismiss was filed saying no change circumstances. The trial court did what the trial court is supposed to do at that point. Look at the pleadings and say, does it show adequately that there is this change of circumstances that allows us to move forward? The trial court did that and allowed the case to move forward and makes a denial of the motion to dismiss. That's in December of 2019. Fast forward a couple months later to February of 17, 2020. Mother files a notice of dismissal voluntarily. Just decides at that point I'm dismissing the entire thing. That's your electronic record 696. Father objects to the notice of dismissal. And that's electronic record 697 on February 18, 2020. Mother files a reply in support of her voluntary notice of dismissal of the underlying petition, which is what is here before you today. So when your client filed that notice of voluntary dismissal, had Mr. Vandenbosch responded? He had not, Your Honor. And that's why Judge Bergen in her minute entry says she's allowed to voluntarily dismiss this and agrees with mother. Well, Bergen dismissed it on the equivalent of a 12B. No, that was an earlier petition. That was back in 2017. 
there was another petition filed and there was dismissal. The underlying petition here, and this is what I think confused the commissioner who took over the case too. There was an underlying petition filed in October of 2019. That's the petition that's before you today. There was a motion to dismiss in December of 2019 filed by father. Judge Bergen denies it and says, no, I'm going to let it go forward. Let's, let's see what you have. Mother, no response is filed. Mother files a voluntary motion to dismiss and, and the court grants that and does that by minute entry in February of 2020. So there was motion practice on a motion to dismiss. There was a oral argument initially on the most original motion to dismiss. And there was presumably a motion. And there was a motion. And a response. Father, right, and a response. And that was denied, that first one. And then we have a voluntary, so. Yes, so, so why, why are we here and how did we get here, right? Well, no, I, I guess I'd ask the other question, which is how can you oppose a motion to dismiss and then voluntarily dismiss and say there's no responsibility? Because, Your Honor, at that point in time, there had been um, significant developments with respect to the eldest child. And there also had been a court-appointed advisor's report that identified certain things which actually mom agreed with. And the offer was, let's just adopt some of these things that are in the court-appointed advisors as a therapeutic solution. Because so many times in family law, we try to give things a legal solution. And really, what is required is a therapeutic solution. And so the court holds then on mother's motion, on mother's voluntary motion to dismiss, and the court's minute entry saying, I agree with mother, a status conference on February, I want to say it's February 20th, um, 21st. 2020, right before the world completely changed. That status conference goes on for 90 minutes as the court helps the parties come up with a therapeutic solution. And ultimately, it's decided the motion to dismiss will be held in abeyance because there may be some other things we can do to help this family. What ultimately happens is father's counsel drafts a stipulation to reinstate for temporary orders, which reinstates the, the underlying petition that we're here for you today with some interesting exceptions. And one of them is we're going to deal just with legal decision making, not parenting time. Because for parenting time, what we're going to do is we're going to put in a therapeutic interventionist who's going to help the parenting time with respect to this child and mother and the reunification process. Therapeutic interventionist is as to parenting time, not as to legal decision making. But the only thing that the underlying petition now is about is legal decision making. That petition specifically says, and again, it's, it's in your record 704, it's a stipulated order for temporary orders that the parties stipulate that the petition is going to be reinstated. And so now the court when we finally get to trial in October of 2021, is blaming mother entirely for continuing this process when mother didn't continue the process. Mother tried to dismiss the process, and then mother came up with a therapeutic solution for the process. So, so your, your argument is, is more the, the total number rather than the award. It's, I mean, if she files a petition, and then uh, uh, call, the adversary moves to dismiss, and you, have, you brief it out, you argue it, and you win. And then you say, I'm going to voluntarily dismiss it. Seems like there might be something there. But you're saying after that, after she had said, I want to voluntarily dismiss, there's no reason Right. For, for those fees, is that what your argument is? That, that's one of the arguments, Your Honor. I think that's a very good argument, actually. Um, the two months that this matter was pending, maybe there were some attorney's fees, but, it, but there was no response by father. Father could have put this case at issue by doing a response. Father didn't do anything during those two months. The parties get the court-appointed advisor's report. Mother goes into court saying, we kind of, we kind of agree with this. Let's do this. There's, there needs to be a therapeutic solution. 
So I just want to emphasize, so that's one reason. The court is holding mother completely responsible for attorney's fees based upon the fact that she's pursuing this petition when it was a stipulation to reinstate the petition. And it was actually even a stipulation drafted by the other side for a therapeutic solution. The second reason the court gives is mother failed to go through with the TI process. And that, again, is a stipulation where the parties agreed that we would not go forward with the TI process, that the TI would be dismissed. And why did they do that? Because just a few days later after that stipulation is, the par parents agree to send the child to a residential in-treatment program in Utah. So there's no reason for a therapeutic intervention process. By the way, and I would just as an aside, which is a little bit of a nuance here, therapeutic intervention was for reunification of mother and daughter for parenting time. That wasn't even in the underlying petition. The underlying petition was about legal decision making. That aside, the parents agree that the child is going to Utah several day, couple days after the stipulation is signed. Again, a stipulation to dismiss the TI. Child goes to the residential treatment center in Utah, comes back, what happens? Reunification with mom. So Council, I mean, taking your argument to, you know, to the log logical extension, are you even contesting the, the decision uh, itself, which is uh, the denial of, of your client's petition? Yes, that's the second point. So, so the first is we're... we're that we're, seems a little... Well, no, I mean, hear what you have to say. Your Honor, we're hammered with attorney's fees, claiming this is all blamed on mother, when in fact it isn't mother's fault. There's a stipulation to reinstate the petition. There's a stipulation by the parties to terminate the TI. As soon as the child goes to the residential in-treatment center, where they do have parental therapy between parent, the parents and the, the child, they come back and they have, they have equal parenting time. So we're back to an equal parenting time schedule. What we are disputing as well, though, is the court's denial of the most of, of the, the denial of mother's petition at trial saying I don't think there's been a material change of circumstances and therefore um, this petition has to get dismissed and never goes through the 25403 factors and that's not the law the court is required under 25403 in a contested legal decision making or parenting time court the court shall make specific findings on the record about all relevant factors and the reason for which the decision is in the best interest of the child. The court never does that. It's in our pre-hearing statements where everybody goes through the factors and all of the evidence. Court instead says, you know what, these parents don't get along. They haven't gotten along since 2017. And Council, so doesn't the court only get to the 403 factors after it's determined that there's a material change in circumstances? But you have to make that change of determination two different ways. One is you should make that at the very beginning because that's what the court is required to do. And what the cases say is that before you even get to that kind of hearing, you need to make that determination as to whether or not the pleadings adequately indicate that there's been a material change of circumstances affecting the welfare of the child. But it, is the court somehow bothered. bound then? What, let's say the court... Um, finds as a preliminary matter that based on the, the pleading itself, there's a material change of circumstances, and the court gets to an evidentiary hearing and concludes, no, actually there's not, now that I've heard testimony or evidence presented. Is the court obligated to follow its initial finding on that? Um, no, Your Honor, I don't think so. If the court's making that decision based upon factors that affect the welfare of the child, which are stated in 25403. Not just because father says, I'm not, I can't get along with mother. Well, but there seems to be two separate inquiries. First, has there been a change in circumstances? And then you go to 403. It seems like you're urging that the court needed to do everything uh, at once. No, I, I, think, I think you're correct, Your Honor, but I think that when you decide if there's been a material change of circumstances, it has to be circumstances that affect the welfare of the child, not, and, and, and so 403 gives us that guidance. What are the kind of factors that would affect the welfare of the child? So, 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 so the court is supposed to look at those 
factors to determine whether there's a change of circumstances? There, the changes of circumstances would be, there aren't specific factors that talk about the changes of circumstances. But it can't be just dad gets veto power because that's not a change. That's not, otherwise mom is in a lose-lose situation. She could never regain joint legal decision making if father just continually comes in saying, we don't get along. Well, I mean, I guess I'm kind of confused because is the court's error in not following, in not making findings on the four or three factors, or is it in making the initial determination of no change in circumstances? Both, Your Honor. Because if the court, if the court does need to be able to state that there has been, that there hasn't been a material change of circumstances. In this case, the court based that on the fact that the parties don't get along. That's not anywhere here in any factor that talks about, that gives us some guidance as to what's in the best interest of the child. That may be in the best interest of father. It's not necessarily in the best interest of the children. So counsel, and I'm just, I'm reading from Judge Ash's minute entry here. What about the, there's credible evidence presented that mother is still consuming alcohol. Your Honor, that- So that is a change of circumstance, but just not a good one for your client. No, Your Honor, though, but that was never even brought up by father. And father admits at the hearing that they're not alleging alcohol abuse. There's no order, by the way, that says mom can't have a drink occasionally. Mom can't abuse alcohol, and mom can't make it so that her abuse is a, is something that would harm the children in some way. And initially, back in 2016, there were findings with respect to alcohol abuse. Mother, she made those changes. She followed all of the things the court said that she needed to do. And in doing so, she met all of those requirements. In addition, she was also at a point where she was off the scram, off the interlock. The courts all agree. There's no dispute that constituted a change of circumstances. Where the dispute is, is that if the parties don't get along and haven't got along, can we continue then to say there's been no change of circumstances? And that year- Bergen said that. Judge Bergen, not Judge Ash. Judge Bergen, you're right. That's precisely what she said. Judge Ash, though, doesn't, says very similar. Page three, second. These parties can't get along, and that, they haven't been able to get along since 2017. She doesn't say that because occasionally mom might have a sip of alcohol, that that is otherwise then a problem that affects the minor children and is therefore, mom hasn't satisfied that requirement. That is nowhere in the record. I see I'm down to about three minutes, if I could reserve my time. Okay, thank you, counsel. Good morning, your honors. May it please the court, Nicholas Brown and Helen Davis on behalf of the appellee, Kyle Van Den Bosch. The trial court was well within its discretion when it denied mother's petitions and award part of father's attorney fees to him for the underlying petitions. I wanted to pick up on something that was just discussed about whether or not there was a sufficient change of circumstances. There was talk about the motion to dismiss and the subsequent appearance before Judge Bergen. And I want to read to you what she said. Well, I do find that she's made sufficient allegations to survive a motion to dismiss based on change of circumstance. But I want to make it clear that once I take testimony, okay, depending on what evidence I believe and don't believe, I could find at that point in time, and I have in other cases, that there was not actually, that there isn't a sufficient material change in circumstance in order to proceed from there. And that was back in December of 2019. So mother has been on notice since at least then that the court could find there is no material change of circumstance. Here, mother's bar is high. This court is only going to reverse whether or not there was a change of circumstance or not if there's an abuse of discretion. And Pridgen tells us what that means is a clear absence of evidence to support its actions. Counsel, let me ask you, so on page four of your answering brief, and this is just the sentence at the very top. It says, the 2016 ruling, so that's McKittish. The 2016 ruling also referenced an automatic reversion 
to joint legal decision making if and when mother completed all the requisite steps i guess is that accurate i mean it's in your brief uh is it accurate whether the order said that that it said there would be an automatic reversion if uh mother completed all of the requisite steps i do believe that's accurate in the 2016 order your honor which was the subject of a special action and appeal to this court which were then rendered moot by subsequent um orders entered by judge kramer later in 2017 there was also a subsequent petition to modify filed by mother which resulted in an agreement on the record in 2017 where the parties stipulated that father would have sole legal decision making and the court entered final language which was not appealed uh and then and then i guess with bergen's motion uh the motion to dismiss she granted um that wasn't appealed correct and and that art this argument was raised at that time the mckittish talks about a fact court an acronym fact f-a-s-t and and says what what you call automatic reversion although it's not that there's there's both mandatory and 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 non-mandatory language in that says upon mother's successful graduation from fact court was there ever a successful graduation from fact court in this case your honor i'm not aware that there was an actual graduation but i do know that she was no longer subject to fact court after the party stipulation in 2017 so that is correct that the conditions are no longer present mother has not been subject to those for a couple years now which she has previously raised in prior attempts to modify legal decision making and parenting time also with regard to the 2016 order that's not the order that was sought to be modified it would be the 2017 order which would be modified and even if we were looking at the 2016 order gish tells us that's inappropriate we can't have these automatic provisions that abdicate the trial court's authority to make a determination of whether a change of circumstances has occurred and whether or not any proposed change would be in the best interest of the child that is squarely within the trial court's authority and it has to do that and deepest quality says that as well we can't abdicate that to third parties as well here the superior court heard evidence from mother from father from the therapeutic interventionist herself as well as dr david weinstock who helped father with co-parenting um coaching and techniques to deal with the ongoing conflict with mother council i mean i have another question so judge ash if you look at at her decision after the evidentiary hearing maybe half of it is cut and pasted from bergen's motion to dismiss decision can can a court rely on a i guess i apologize i'm not family court i'm thinking 12b6 in my mind but um can a court rely on an earlier court's decision on the pleadings when making a decision after an evidentiary hearing in this case it can your honor because judge bergen found that mother's allegations in the 2018 petition were contradictory in one breath she says i need decision making changed because father is unilaterally making decisions without my input and we can't get along can't make decisions the other hand we actually can make decisions together it's logistically possible so i need to petition to modify immediately and the court says well no you've just contradicted yourself i'm dismissing this petition and she made factual findings as to mother's own allegations in the 2018 petition which mother never sought to amend alter reconsider or appeal to the she made factual findings in a motion to dismiss as to the allegations that mother presented yes and judge ash summed it up she said that the same changes of circumstances that the court rejected in april 2019 that's what mother's arguing now the court found that these are high conflict parents which was present from both parties testimony from the therapeutic interventionist as well as dr weinstock they're no more able to make decisions now than they were able to do so in 2017 the trial court also found that mother's allegations that father did not make decisions in the best interest of the children was not credible to the contrary the court credited father's testimony dr weinstock's testimony that father seeks mother's input 
He has above average parenting skills, and he demonstrates a willingness to seek input from others in making decisions. The court specifically what about found- the question, counsel, sure. that, that your colleague started with? The fee question. Well, father was awarded $30,000 of his attorney fees. He applied for over 130,000. So he was only awarded a portion of that. 109 were from attorney fees, about 19,000 were fees related to Dr. Lanzalotta, and the remaining amount was uh, costs. The court only needs to look at reasonableness and financial disparity in deciding whether or not to award fees. And it doesn't have to do that. The statute under section 25 through 24 says that it's discretionary. We acknowledge that. Mother's AFI was admitted at trial as exhibit two. Her AFI, which was signed by her, demonstrated income of almost $50,000 per month, which was well above father's 35,000. When was the a AFI dated? Your Honor, I don't have that in front of me, but I do know they were updated shortly before trial. Oh, they were, okay. uh, Yes, we did need updated AFIs for trial. Uh, and I do know that mother's Ameriprise account was also admitted into evidence as an exhibit. I believe 265, 264, showing that she had over $6.6 .6 million in that account as of April 30th, 2021. And the trial here was October 1st, 2021. So the court's finding that mother had more financial resources than father should be affirmed. And on that basis alone, the court can award not only the award of attorney fees, but the amount of attorney fees. Mother has focused mostly on the reasonableness prong here today. And the trial court found many reasons why mother was unreasonable throughout the litigation. There was a discussion about participation with the TI process. It is true, the parties did stipulate to terminate Dr. Lanzalotta's involvement as a therapeutic interventionist months after she had been doing that work. I don't disagree with that. But a party's conduct in the TI process may still form a basis for the trial court to award attorney fees if that party did not cooperate with the TI's assignments, did not follow recommendations of the TI, contradicted itself when making parenting time plans with the TI and then going back on them the next week, refusing to check in with the TI due to a lash appointment. The trial court had discretion to find mother's actions during the TI process unreasonable. And that can also form the basis for the fee award in this case. Counsel, um, <clears throat> help me through the timeline on some of this. And sure. uh, I, may ha I may be mistaken on some of this, but the, the, the petition to modify that started why we're here, it was oct filed October 2019, correct? It is correct, Your Honor. And then uh, father filed a motion to dismiss, which was denied. Then four, roughly four months later, mother files a request to go ahead and dismiss her own petition, correct? That is correct, Your Honor. Which the court denies, or at least father objects to, correct? Father did object to it, and then before Judge Bergen, I believe, um, the parties stipulated to the TI process, and mother agreed to withdraw her notice of dismissal. Okay, so then there's a partial agreement, and then there's another petition I think the most I think the most recent one is August of 21. That is correct, is that Your correct? Honor. Yes, and when the petition was when the when the notice, sorry, there's like dismissals and withdrawals all over the place. After the notice of dismissal was withdrawn by mother, it was agreed by the parties to be reinstated and focus on legal decision making. So that was the issue before the trial court on October 1st. The August 2021 petition to modify that concerned the party's other two children and only as it relates to legal decision making as well. So basically we had a trial and legal decision making for all three children in October 1st, 2021. So the, the, in the fee, I, I, again, reading from Ash's decision, the first, is, the first reason for unreasonableness is quote, mother acted unreasonably by continuing to pursue this action without a material change in circumstance affecting the welfare of the children. Number two, by failing to follow through with the TI. And then number three, by challenging child's high school application. So there was more than just the TI? That is correct, Your Honor. So initially there was a petition filed in 2018 and that was the dismissal, that was dismissed on the motion to dismiss in April, 2019. 
and that petition was to modify legal decision making because mother wanted the minor child to apply to different schools than dad did, apparently. That was denied. Father had sole legal decision making. It was within his authority to make educational decisions. Later, during the 2019 and I guess 2021 petition involving the twins, those also involved allegations surrounding the minor children's schooling. The mother continued to challenge his authority, had previously went behind father's back and spoke with the eldest daughter and tried to apply to schools without father finding out, which he did. Then later, continued to tell both Dr. Pikus and her attorney that she wanted the party's daughter to go to a different school. And that was admitted into evidence at Exhibit 312. Same email where she calls father a monster, complete monster. And that was during litigation of this case. Finally, during the first part of her testimony at the October 1st trial, it focused on father's choice to send the child to a particular high school and how she disagreed with that action and how it wasn't in the child's best interest, which Judge Ash disagreed with and found to the contrary, father is making decisions in the best interest of the children, including the party's daughter. There was also an email that was admitted into evidence showing that while the child was in inpatient therapy, mother attempted to have the high school changed again and asked father to change schools. So mother has disagreed with the choice of high school before the petition and during the petition. But does that, does that make her position unreasonable just because she just, I know dad has uh, legal decision-making authority, but disagreeing with dad, is that, that make her position unreasonable because she's not allowed to have a different opinion? She's absolutely allowed to have a different opinion. What she's not allowed to do is first come to the court saying that the choice of high school is not in the child's best interest and father's not making good decisions, which the court disagrees with and denies her petition. Then to bring it up again, stating that father's decision of high schools are not in the children's best interest, saying that we can get along, we can make decisions together now, which is not true. They cannot do that. Um, her insistence on injecting that issue into the litigation is what is unreasonable. Fathers shouldn't have to defend the choice of high school on October 1st, 2021, if she was not pursuing it at that point, when she absolutely was pursuing the ability to make educational decisions for all three children at that point. It isn't the unreason, right? There are three reasons in Ash's decision, but Maybe what Ash was say, Judge Ash was saying is that um, you have a, a party raising identical arguments, um, staccato, repetitively, without changed facts. Is that what she was saying? I think when you read her decision in the context of the other findings she made, I do think that's what she's saying. Because she started her decision by noting, mother's bringing the same alleged change of circumstances that she's brought before. I'm hearing the same story over and over again, that you say you can get along, but you can't get along. You say father won't take things into account, but then you tell me you made one decision. You've told me you disagree with father's choice of high school, and it was wrong of him to make a unilateral decision when he had sole legal decision. What about Ash's, the sentence in Judge Ash's opinion where she says, um, on the change of circumstance paragraph that there is credible evidence presented that mother is still consuming alcohol. It, it, I mean, it's in that change of circumstance. In fact, the sentence says words change. Was that a change of circumstance? Uh, uh, I guess that's sort of um, ambiguous. Um, that, that would help uh, mother or father? I don't think... Or, or, or neither. Right. The, the fact that she may be consuming alcohol is not a change of circumstance. Mother previously abused alcohol, that's true, but that wasn't brought up. The fact that she may or may not be abusing alcohol was not part of the October hearing. The f she did admit she was drinking alcohol in light of assault charges and being under these drug monitoring orders and you know, all that. That is with her discretion to do, I suppose, but that was not a change of circumstance at that point that she is still consuming alcohol because she was consuming alcohol before as well. Well, I mean, we're looking from the last order in place, which was... Uh, um, the 2017. 2017. And I don't think she was. I mean, she was... She had just finished the 
the program. So she, she was released from conditions on monitoring, but there was no testimony given by either side as to whether or not at that point in time she was or was not consuming alcohol at all. So the trial court did not hear any evidence as to that point. So there's no comparative point. Correct. So we don't know if she was consuming alcohol, if it was once a week, once a month, none at all. Could be. That is simply not in the record. So that cannot form any sort of change of circumstance for the basis for Judge Ash's denial of the two petitions. At this point, the trial court was well within its discretion to accept father's testimony, find mother's not credible, especially with over 300 proposed exhibits, countless emails that were admitted into evidence, the CAA's report, which was admitted into evidence, testimony from the therapeutic interventionist, as well as Dr. Weinstein. This is a record that is well supported. The trial court did what she was able to do, which was deny these petitions. Can I hear you correctly that your client asked for over $100,000 in fees? That is correct, Your Honor. In the application for attorney fees, it was approximately $130,000, $109,000 of which were attorney fees, dating back to the October 2019 original petition. So at that point, the litigation had been going on for almost two years. It also included fees relating to Dr. Lanzalotta's work as a therapeutic interventionist, which father shared a part of. So the judge thought only $3,000 worth was reasonable? I'm sure father would have liked more fees awarded, but we didn't appeal that decision. We've accepted that the judge was in her discretion to, one, award fees at all. She could have denied any request for fees. She chose not to. She chose to award father, upon his request, his attorney fees based on financial disparity and reasonableness. And that's supported by the record here. Okay. In sum, mother has a high bar here today. You have to find that the trial court had no evidence to support its actions, given its wide discretion in determining whether or not a change of circumstances has occurred. There's evidence in the record from both parties that there was no change of circumstances from the prior petitions that had been filed, denied, or otherwise resolved by stipulation and entered as a court order. The court had authority to award attorney fees in its discretion. It determined that mother, both on financial prongs and reasonableness prongs, should pay a portion of father's attorney fees and awarded only a portion of attorney fees. On this record, the court should affirm the October 22nd order from Judge Ash. Thank you, counsel. Thank you, your honors. I wanted to just make one brief comment because Mr. Brown had indicated that AFIs were submitted and indicated some disparity. The order from Commissioner Ash does indeed state what the party's income is. And on page five of that October 19th, 2021 order indicates father's income is $39,558 a month, mother's income $34,490 a month. So I just wanted to make sure that that was clear in the record as to the court having made those findings. With respect to the lack of change of material change of circumstances affecting the welfare of the children, father has acknowledged before you today that alcohol was no longer the issue. When that original stipulation was filed in 2017 that father would have sole legal decision making, mother was still under various court orders, including there was an interlock device, she was under scram testing. That eventually went away and both Judge Bergen and Commissioner Ash make it very clear that mother has met those requirements and that alcohol and lack of that alcohol abuse would affect the welfare of the children and would constitute a material change of circumstances. That is not disputed. What is disputed is the court then goes on to say, but you know, these parties file petitions and they file actions and they say they can agree, but they really can't agree and they can't agree and therefore why have joint legal decision making? Father's making decisions, we're going to keep it that way. There's been no material change of circumstances since 2017 because these parties still can't make decisions together. And that's not the criteria because under that criteria, the party who is denied 
joint legal decision making at any point in time, even in this case when it's by a stipulation, can never regain joint legal decision making at any time because all the other side has to say, all that parent has to say is, nope, I don't agree, we don't make decisions together. So mother tries to... Oh, the court gets to determine credibility. The, the court gets to determine credibility, but on this case it's not even necessary because the credibility could be, I don't believe you're going to be able to make decisions together. But the court doesn't identify the factors. The court makes that the single factor as to why there's been no material change in circumstances. And that's not the factor. Mother no longer is abusing alcohol. Everyone agrees that's a material change in circumstances. That factor affects the best interest and the welfare of the ch children. Now what the court needs to do is to go through the 25403 factors, because now we have a disputed issue, and determine whether or not, or 403.112 as well, 4001, and now determine whether or not we should have joint legal decision making, sole legal decision making, or that hybrid that courts sometimes do, which is joint, but there's an, if there's an impasse, one parent gets to make the final decision. And we never get to that. So in, at, at a minimum, remanding this back to the trial court so the trial court can make findings having found that there's and been a material change. Counsel, if you could finish up. You're at, I'll give you 10 more seconds. So, so at a minimum, then, it goes back to the trial court to make specific findings on having found that there was a material change of circumstances based upon the fact that there is no longer alcohol abuse, looking at the, the factors that the court is required to make determine whether or not there are facts sufficient to identify either joint, legal, or um, sole legal decision making. And that was never done in this case. Thank you, Your Honors. Um, I want to thank you both for your helpful arguments today. And um, we will take it under advisement, issue a decision in due course. And with that, we are adjourned.